Hi, everyone. Welcome to Family Matters. For this episode, we are joined by Dr. Gail Whitelaw, audiologist and clinical associate professor and clinic director for the Department of Speech and Hearing Science at The Ohio State University. Welcome, Dr. Whitelaw. We're so excited to have you joining us today. Thank you so much, Abby. I'm so happy to be here. Can you first tell our family members listening about your role at The Ohio State University and the services provided there that you oversee? Sure. Um, I am a clinical preceptor, so I teach Doctor of Audiology students and Masters of Speech Language Pathology students about hearing and listening and all the things that can happen across the range of a lifetime. And we provide direct clinical services, which includes hearing evaluation, um, teaching people how to use their auditory systems better, hearing aids as part of that, um, other assistive technology. Right now, hearing aids are amazing and connect to amazing Bluetooth technology. And um, so we do all of that here and more. We work with people who have ringing in their ears. We work with people who have cognitive impairments. We work with little children and we work with older adults. So the whole range is in our, our wheelhouse. Every day is a new day there, huh? It is. Every day is a great new day here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I know one of your passions is providing education, advocating for those with hearing loss, informing the public about all things related to hearing loss. Can you share a little bit with the families the importance of early identification of hearing impairments? Sure. Um, the average adult waits somewhere between seven and 10 years to do something about their hearing loss. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Hearing loss often sneaks up on people. Unless you have an illness or um, take chemotherapy or something like that, it's not likely that your hearing loss is going to appear overnight. And for many people, they will say things like, gee, people nowadays don't speak clearly. They kind of mumble. Or um, restaurants aren't like what they used to be, you know, when they used to be quiet. So they'll start to notice a little bit more in background noise, but it takes a lot to convince some folks to really do something about their hearing loss because they think it's someone else or they think, oh, it's just a little hearing loss. And the one thing, like many things in life, hearing loss, working through an early intervention pro project or program or perspective is really, really critical. That the earlier we find people with hearing loss, the better we can address it in terms of treatment, the less impact it has on their lives. And so we're really focusing on how do we catch people early on? Um, we participate in a lot of community hearing screenings. We um, do, like you said, a lot of education for people. And um, we get a lot of follow through from that because they didn't know what they didn't know, which is, Go and get it done early. And even if they tell you you have normal hearing, great news. Um, you know, then and again, two, three, five years from then, you'll get it tested again. But for many people, the proof of the pudding is really in the hearing testing because you can't determine necessarily on your own because it is so subtle. That is really an amazing statistic, seven years that it goes unidentified. So when you mentioned the seven years, um, you know, that's because maybe, maybe the older adult is either denying that the hearing impairment is present or they just don't realize, like you said, that they don't, they have a hearing impairment. What toll does that hearing loss take on their communication abilities? Oh, there's so many tolls. Um, I just saw, right before we started recording, I just saw one of my very, very favorite patients who's in his 80s, and he is so sharp, and his hearing loss is really bothersome to him, and he still works, um, and his son will say in their corporate meetings um, things like, my dad can't hear anything anyways, and so it gets between family members. For many adults, it results in withdrawal or frustration. Um, it impacts quality of life significantly. Um, I, I will tell you a story that um, we saw a patient a number of years ago whose daughter happened to work at Ohio State with me. And I call this the birthday party story. I tell it a lot. She was a lady who um, was uh, coming up on her 90th birthday, about six months out from her 90th birthday. And her daughter said to me, my mother is totally withdrawn. We used to have these Sunday dinners where our whole family would get together and everybody would have such a great time. And now when the family comes over, my mom goes to another room and says, I can't hear anything anyways, so I don't want to participate. 
and I'd really like to help her. But she said her 90th birthday is coming up and that's a wonderful milestone to reach. But you know, I want my mom to hear all the things that people would say about her at her funeral. And at the time I was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Um, after we fit her with hearing aids, it changed this woman's life significantly. She was engaged in her life again. Her daughter told me that after her 90th birthday party, she was the life of the party. And people were telling her exactly what they thought about how wonderful she is and what a kind woman she had been and things that she had done for them throughout their life. And she heard every word. And a few weeks after that, her she had a cardiology appointment and the cardiologist came in and was chatting with her. And then he kind of left abruptly. And the daughter and the mom were like, what is this? And he came back in and he said, who are you? And where's the woman that used to come here who couldn't communicate and um, was really withdrawn and always seemed depressed? And she said, well, I got hearing aids and I know what to do to hear now. And I thought that's such a great story of quality of life and ability to hear what you want to hear. And there's a whole lot of other things about cognition I know we're going to talk about, but those are the main things, you know, hearing what you want to hear. I hear from a lot of older adults, grandchildren's voices, little girls and little boy voices are hard to hear because they're high frequency in nature. And that's where most people have a hearing loss. And so they may miss that. They may miss hearing on the telephone or needing to turn the television up so loud that other people don't want to watch it with them. So things you might enjoy socially are also withdrawn from you in that case. So that's interesting that you, the story that you shared, if, if she didn't get the hearing intervention that she so needed, she could have been at risk for more social isolation. You know, as we know, that could be one of the risks associated with the hearing loss. Some other risks include cognitive decline, risk for falls, um, any, other, in, any other risks that I'm missing? Or are you able to touch on the risk for cognitive decline or the risk for falls? Sure. Um, so let's talk about falls first. Um, you know, audiologists, which, of which I am one of, look at both hearing and balance. They're both in the inner ear. And we know that the research states that the more hearing loss you have, the more likely you are to have vestibular or balance problems. And if that's the case, that's really significant, especially as we age. Fall risk is huge. And getting hearing testing and looking at vestibular issues can help to kind of sway that away from being as significant. So that's something that most people don't know about, but it is so important because once you fall in your home, um, the chances of getting back to that home are often uh, much slimmer than they would be if you had never fallen. Um, you end up in a rehab facility. You may end up um, with really limited mobility. And those things are really very difficult if you can prevent them. From a cognitive perspective, when I was in grad school many, many years ago, we used to think that hearing loss was just an inconvenience. Like people would say, huh, and what? And, you know, it wasn't all that big of a deal. Research out of Johns Hopkins starting about 20 years ago started to look at health conditions and how they impacted quality of life. And they did hearing testing as part of this. And it's interesting because the research out of Johns Hopkins started to show this trend, which was hearing loss and cognition were really, really closely tied together. So the hearing loss that people have shows us that the ear is a really important window to the brain and delivers really significant information. It's not just an inconvenience, it's necessary to maintain cognitive function. And so a couple of things about that. One is that we used to think that you had to have some big deal of hearing loss. What the research out of Johns Hopkins said that even people with what we would consider mild hearing loss when we test it, so maybe they're a little inconvenienced. They may say ha or what once in a while. Even that mild degree of hearing loss has an impact on cognitive abilities. What the research out of Johns Hopkins continues to show us is that cognitive ability is influenced by a lot of different things, but hearing loss is one of the treatable, preventable things that can improve cognition. The other aspect of that is that cognitive abilities can be impacted in so many significant ways by hearing loss, but also ties into anxiety and depression. And then some issues related to 
people not understanding that hearing loss impacts your ability to process, to think, to use information accurately because your brain is fighting harder to bring that information in. So someone's talking to you and the whole time you're going, did they say this or this? Did they say this or this? And so it impacts executive functioning also. And I don't know about you, but I always want to have my executive functioning working as well as it can Me too. because um, I want to make sure that I don't miss things or that I don't have to work harder than I than I really have to. And so even when it's not impacting the cognitive aspects of the brain per se, it's impacting a lot of the behaviors that go along with listening, with cognition, with language processing that are so critical for families. Um, they impact quality of life. They impact ability to follow instructions. So if a patient, say, is hospitalized and they can't hear their physician accurately, the physician may think, oh, this person has a cognitive impairment, and they overlook the simplest aspect of this, which is hearing impairment. And so the two are really um, intertwined in so many ways. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say, you know, if we could provide some kind of amplification or some kind of hearing aid to someone with a hearing impairment that may already have a little bit of a cognitive decline that can actually help. It could, I'm guessing this is what you're saying. It can actually help slow the rate of the cognitive decline. So it's not progressing. Absolutely. And that, and that makes sense because they're getting that auditory auditory input, you know, mm. which is going to overall help their cognition. Okay, and you know, I, one thing I did want to point out with that is many people don't want to get hearing aids because there's a stigma associated with them. Oh, you know, it makes me look old. Well, first of all, I need to say that I fit every age range from little tiny babies to I think my oldest patient here has been 105. Um, and I'm going to tell you that hearing aids aren't like your grandpa's hearing aids anymore. They are um, they're mini computers that fit on the ear. They connect to cell phones and other devices and microphones that a person can wear. They come in fun fashion colors. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I fit a 17 year old with pink hearing aids. And um, one of my friends was bringing her grandma in that afternoon. And I said, hey, I looked at your hearing aids and you got the same color pink as my 17 year old patient did this morning. And she said, of course, I'm going to get pink hearing aids. I want the world to see that I'm able to hear better. And I said, well, my, my kid is getting um, stickers from Etsy that are spikes that she's putting on her hearing aids. And she's like, you can get stickers for your hearing aids? And it was the greatest interaction because I think, you know, a 17-year-old and an 85-year-old still want to be styling this stuff. And people don't think so much about hearing aids anymore. It's not like the stigma that there used to be. I know that you have to be able to define that for yourself and that many people feel uncomfortable, but I always tell people that if you think people don't know you have a hearing loss, they do. Um, they read it. Your family compensates for it. Your friends compensate for it. And the thing that you can do to help yourself compensate for it and have a better quality of life is to pursue amplification. And I don't make any money on selling hearing aids here. So I can say this, you know, without a doubt that it's very easy to find technology that works beautifully for you across a range of costs and a range of insurance providers. And so I would encourage anybody who's thinking, ah, I'm not hearing so well to think about some of that technology. Technology has certainly progressed, you know, all the capabilities of the hearing aids, it seems. And they're not the big hunk hunky you know, chunk of device that sat behind the ear. Yeah, they're very sleek nowadays. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you you might have mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'd like to see if we could expand. Um, we mentioned cognitive impairment, and we mentioned mild cognitive impairment, and the using of the amplification, and that could help slow the rate. What what is the link between hearing impairment and dementia? I know that they're related. We've talked about how cognition and the ears are so closely related. Is there actually um, a link or research behind, you know, dementia, the diagnosis of dementia and a hearing impairment? 
Yes, there is. Um, actually, just as recently as last week, there was a study that came out to say that a lot of it seems to be related to um, signal processing. You know, when we think about signal processing, we think about that as a term that applies to computers or to hearing aids or to your iPhone. Um, your brain does signal processing too. And when it has to fight to put information together, when it doesn't recognize what the message is, it really degrades the brain. Um, there's also physical research that talks about um, jokingly calling it brain shrinkage, but that's actually what it is, that when the brain doesn't get the input that it needs, it tends to shrink. And we need all of that white matter that we have and all of that gray matter that we have to make sure that we're able to process and listen and understand and use the language that we're used to using. And that when you don't have that input from the auditory system, you find that the brain changes itself anatomically, not just physiologically or um, thinking about this. When this all stuff all started coming out, I was getting a little uncomfortable in talking about it because it seemed that it was a marketing ploy from hearing aid manufacturers. You know, oh, you better get hearing aids because if you don't, you're going to get dementia. But separate from that, the research continues to show that that message is correct. It's not because we want to sell hearing aids to people, which I always want to sell solutions to people if they need them. Um, however, it's really the fact of the matter of all the stuff we didn't realize about the brain. And now we do realize and ways that we can use sensory input, visual input, auditory input to improve the quality of our thinking, to improve the quality of our brains. And there is a litany of research that's out there in this. So it's not something that hearing aid manufacturers are making up, but places like the British Medical Journal are publishing it. And Johns Hopkins, which is hard to find a more reputable place that does you know, research, um, their, their research continues to produce new information in that. Okay, thank you so much for addressing that. Um, you know, seeking treatment once a hearing impairment um, has been identified can be challenging. You know, the loved one of an older adult with a hearing impairment, they may not know where to find providers and resources, um, if they should go to over-the-counter, if they need to see an audiologist, they may not realize insurance can help with this kind of coverage. What should families expect after, you know, they've either identified there's a hearing loss or they suspect there's a hearing loss? And how can a family member support them to access any kind of care? That's a really great question. And I would encourage people to say, let's find a way to have a relationship because this is all about relationship building. It's the process. It's not the product. And I can't say that often enough. Um, there's lots of advertising on television about hearing aids. There's lots of, you know, if you happen to live in Florida, you can't drive by a, a crossroads and not see a billboard for selling hearing aids. I encourage people to look for an audiologist who will answer their questions, who will um, address all the things they want to talk about. And there is no pressure for sale because it's the process and not the product. I am working with you to build a relationship. That's what you need from me. And that's what I need from you. And that also means that if you're the significant other or a family member going with the person who's being tested, you should come prepared for questions. You should um, ask whatever you want to know. You should expect the audiologist to spend time with you. There's two things that are critically important in that process. One is something called speech and noise testing. So every audiologist should do speech and noise testing. And if they don't do this, you should ask them why. Um, this is, we may do it under headphones and we might do it through the speakers, but how well do you listen when there's background noise, which is the main concern that people have when they have hearing loss. So we can actually quantify that and give you more information. The other thing is if you're gonna be fit with a hearing aid, we should do a verification that uses what we call real ear measures. It's a little microphone that we put down into the ear canal and put the hearing aid on top of it and it makes a measurement. 
and it shows us how close we are to what you need. Um, it doesn't just rely on subjective information, it relies on objective information. And those two measures can help to give us a lot of knowledge about what your expectations should be, what technology might be best for you. You brought up over-the-counter hearing aids, and those have been available in America since October 17th. And we call those self-fit products, which means you can go on the internet and buy one. Um, you have to, it's only supposed to be for people with mild and moderate hearing losses. So one of the first things is you don't know if you or your loved one has a mild or moderate hearing loss unless it's measured. And secondly, you have to be pretty comfortable and confident that you know how to fit one of these devices because there is no audiology support. It is a product. It's not a process. Um, it works for some people. Um, the idea was to talk about cost. Um, we just saw a patient in here who um, we saw a year ago. She only has hearing loss in one ear. And she tried a hearing aid and liked it, but didn't really want to move ahead at the time. And she's purchased an over-the-counter device and wanted us to make some measurements on that really or measure that verification and it's not providing her any measurable benefit she can't tell when it's on or off and she decided to return it and the cost that she paid for that one hearing aid is the same as our entry level technology here i think a lot of times people are uncomfortable talking about money i need to know from a patient and their family what you can afford what you want to invest in um, what it is that you're looking for. And there's a range of costs of hearing aids. It's not that you have to, some, I saw a gentleman last week and he told me he paid $8,000 for a pair of hearing aids. That's a pretty significant investment. When I evaluated him and we've got some aids we could try on him here, he didn't need to spend near that much money for something that would work well for him. And we knew that because we tried it on him, we made these measurements. And so I think it's important to have open communication and find somebody that you're comfortable working with. Um, if you, you know, if your gut's telling you this isn't the right person for me, and I'll say that from somebody who I often get referrals to me. I also have people who call and say, hey, Gail, can you send me my medical records? I'm going to go somewhere else. I think it's important that you connect with someone and they connect with your family and they understand you and what you're looking for. And they're willing to talk about cost and they're willing to talk about what are your communication needs? Because that could vary if you're in business meetings or you go out to restaurants a lot versus if you're in more quiet environments like your home. Um, that could vary based on what technology might be available for watching TV or listening to the telephone. So all of those things are things you should expect from an audiologist when you meet with one of us. I love the description of process versus product. You don't want to just come away with the product. You want someone that you could talk to, troubleshoot with, you know, review any kind of solution. So thank you for sharing that. That's very important. Sure. We have one more or time for one more quick question. Um, I just want to see if you have any key takeaways that you'd like to share today with our families related to hearing loss, you know, the need for amplification and the link between the hearing loss and cognitive impairments. Sure. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet that I think is important to talk about is that we can retrain our brains. One of the ways we do that with, is with appropriately fitting amplification. The other is by using a program or programs that do what we in the field call oral rehabilitation. That's A-U-R-A-L, which means ear, rehabilitation. But it gives us the opportunity to teach the brain how to listen again. There are some incredible programs out there. Some of them are free. So somebody could go on and choose an app. One of the ones I like is called Word Success. So if you go to your app store, you can download it. And it reteaches your brain how to listen in noise. One of the ones that you can pay for that I think is phenomenal and is based on a lot of research is called Amptify, which is kind of a funny name. And Amptify is fantastic from a listening and learning perspective and it's a game so if you like playing games on your phone you can compete with other people you can win badges um, but it really helps to be a partner with amplification and it keeps that cognitive part of the brain that's related to the ear engaged and learning new information and maybe relearning some things if you waited seven years to do something about your hearing your brain forgets what it's like to listen in noisy environments. So the cacophony of sound that you hear 
things like, oh my gosh, I walked outside and birds were whistling. You and I hear that and our brain says, oh yeah, that's there. That's in our background. But for somebody who's had a hearing loss for seven years, they may really struggle with that. Oh, those birds. And if they don't give their brain the chance to reacclimatize to that, to train itself again, that's always going to be bothersome to them. So one of the messages I think is important is getting the right people to be on your health, hearing healthcare team and then having the patience to work through that. And it does take a little patience, but from everybody that I see, it's well worth the investment of time. Thank you. That's really great information. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with our families all of your knowledge and expertise. My uh, pleasure. I'm I'm sure our families will value your input on this topic, as I know I have. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us and come back next time for our next Family Matters episode.